Production funding for Ruckus has been provided by gifts from Dave and Jamie Cummings, The Hartwig Family, Hush Blackwell, Barbara and Peter Gattermeyer, and by viewers like you. Thank you. Welcome to Ruckus, our weekly food for thought fight over the news of the day and the trends of the times. I'm Mike Shannon. The Ruckettes join me shortly. This first program of 2018 marks the beginning of the 21st year for Ruckus on KCPT. Our topics this week, Kansas City begins the new year with some old problems. Republicans begin 2018 with a tax cut to brag about and the midterms to worry about. And civil rights activists are worrying about Westport sidewalks, plus roast and toast. But we start with our newsmaker segment and focus on the Kansas legislature starting its new term next week. Before returning to Topeka, Joy Coaston, a Republican who represents the 28th district in Leewood, returns for a visit on Ruckus. She spoke with us about a year ago as the first year of her term was starting. We'll find out how it went and how optimistic she is about year number two. Dr. Coaston, welcome back. Thank you. You're a doctor and a legislator. You're uh, an educator, and you have taught extensively in the field of communications, I believe. That is correct. Uh, so you went to Topeka beginning of 2017, optimistic about the future for the state of Kansas. Was your experience a positive one? It was, overwhelmingly so. Um, there were certainly moments of tension and stress and uh, perhaps a little wrangling, but uh, overwhelmingly it was a really positive experience. Would you call the session a successful one? I think so. Um, I, I, from my perspective, uh, it, it, it was very successful. The uh, governor is still Sam Brownback. His federal appointment is yet to be yes. confirmed by the Republican-controlled Senate, and he'll be giving a state of the state this coming Tuesday. The session begins on Monday. What do you expect the governor to say? I wish I knew. I really don't have a... He wishes he knew. I wish I knew. I really don't know what he, uh, what he will say. Um, I think that it will be an interesting evening to listen to uh, how he wants to finish out his term. Uh, I don't know uh, what his vision is for the last uh, year that he has in office. Uh, I, I assume that he may be departing earlier, but uh, I think he pr would probably go into that state of the state with at least some sense of uh, what he hopes to accomplish. We'll talk about school finance here in a moment, but aside from that, what are the other top issues you'll be considering? Well, I think uh, some of the things that we are still talking about would be Medicaid expansion. Are uh, you in favor of that? I am. I absolutely am. Uh, I've spoken to all of our hospital CEOs about what that would mean to them, uh, the, the amount of uncompensated care that they're carrying. Uh, is a tremendous burden to our local hospitals in rural Kansas. We have hospitals that are closing because of uncompensated care. Uh, we've given away over $2 billion of our own federal tax dollars uh, because we haven't uh, adopted the uh, expansion. Uh, so I think that it was, um, it was not in our best interest to do that all these years, and I, I would hope that we would have an opportunity. Do you, do you think a lot of Republicans are in favor of that? I, generally, Republicans have opposed Medicaid expansion in Kansas. I think Republicans are pragmatic, and I think they've seen what, what it has done to our uh, rural hospitals. Well, now, you consider yourself a moderate Republican. Mm -hmm. Do you find yourself working more with Democrats than with conservative oh, no. Republicans? No, 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 I don't think so. And in fact, um, certainly there are, there are people on both extremes for the spectrum that are a little more challenging to find common ground with, but uh, we have an amazing coalition of, of moderate thinkers on both sides of the aisle, and I don't, I don't, uh, I don't think I've had to work very hard to find, find those people. Are, are you comfortable with the way school finance is determined in the state, the ongoing Supreme Court hearings brought by four school districts in the state, including Wichita and Kansas City, Kansas? Uh, you know, I think that the last, what has it been, 25 years of, uh, of, of court cases has certainly been a strain on the state. Yeah. Um, but I think that it's the legislature's job to figure out what that suitable funding is. Um, that's uh, what we have failed to do, so we need to figure well, out how but, to make but it But how work. would you figure it out? There's no clear-cut path that, that I can perceive. Well, you have a, a state constitution that, mm -hmm. that is vague, to say the least, and a Supreme Court that decides there needs to be more money and gives you a date by which to get it 
appropriated, right. Right. but then doesn't give you any clue as to how much it should be. Right. Uh, most constitutional language is vague, <laughs> so if we start worrying about, uh, you know, having to be so finite in our in our word choice uh, in a constitution, uh, that limits our ability to govern. So I think that. Well, there, uh, there was some talk of a constitutional amendment. Mm -hmm to keep the state Supreme Court from having the authority to close schools mm -hmm. if it disagreed with the legislature's funding amount. Would you buy into that? Uh, no, I, I don't think I would. I think, and I think it'd be hard to find uh, a three, you know, three-fourths of, of the, the House to, and the Senate two, to two do thirds, that. Two-thirds, I think. Two-thirds, yeah. I think, I think it would be hard to do that. Yeah. yeah. All right, uh, you're looking forward to this next year. I we am. wish you well. Maybe we'll make this a tradition that the first of every okay. year you come back and tell us how things went. I'd like Are that. you running for re-election? Do you uh, know Yes, yet? I've already filed and uh, already have an opponent, and yes, I will be running. Do you have a favorite Republican for governor? Um, yeah, I think so, but I'm not, I'm not ready to go public Keeping yet. it a secret, yeah, huh? Yeah. All right, All right. Dr. Costa, thank you very much. Thank Good you. to see you again. Nice to see you, Mike. That is Kansas State Representative Joy Coaston. Now let's meet the panel and start a ruckus! Attorney Arthur Benson is with Benson & Associates in Kansas City, Missouri. Ron Freeman is a former talk show host and now a motivational speaker and writer. Mary O'Halloran is a media and communications consultant. And Woody Kozad is head of the Kozad Company, a government relations firm. As I mentioned earlier, this is the beginning of our 21st year on KCPT. <laughs> Thanks to all of you for joining me to kick things off for the 21st year, and a special welcome to Art Benson, known for his legal work on the landmark Kansas City, Missouri school desegregation case. Art, nice to have you with us. Thank you, Mike. As 2017 <coughs> departed Kansas City, it left behind cold weather and hot issues, many still unresolved. What's going to happen in Jackson County government? Why was the Johnson County manager fired? Will a new mayor bring change to Kansas City, Kansas? Is streetcar expansion going to happen? What about east side development? And the list goes on and on. But the one issue that gets more attention than all the others combined, I think, is KCI. Voters gave overwhelming approval to building a new one terminal airport. The city council selected Edgemore to build it and then unselected Edgemore. Edgemore is apparently still in the running and the council says it should decide things by the end of January. So why all this confusion, Mary, and how is it going to end? Well, I, the, the I don't know that it's confusion as much as it is chaos. I, I put the two together. <laughs> Let me rephrase. Why all this chaos, Mary, and how will it end? Well, it's not chaos at all, actually. The, the, when, it, when you have a project the size of the billion-plus uh, airport, then of course they're going to be political jockeying around. They, you know, this it, it, the politics of it was. This is a little poke back in the eye to the mayor for too much secrecy, too much uh, backroom wheeling and dealing early on in the process of the airport decision making. And so, you know, this was a few council people saying, uh, "We're going to show you, we're going to show you that we can also." But, but do Mary, it was the city council that decided. To pick Edgemore as the developer, it is. For the but as they got dealing with the that question, that was a stick in the eye to the mayor too. Well, right? <laughs> Everything well, was a stick in the eye. Let, of me, the mayor. let me just say that, th that there were legitimate questions, as the Kansas City Star has pointed out. There certainly are legitimate questions to be to be decided, including minority hiring, contracting, among other issues. But you know, this this is going on now. They came back and had an almost unanimous vote to to go back to Edgemore, and at the end of January, we'll see whether they're the uh, they're the company that gets the contract. Art, I, still I don't have any problem with what they <laughs> no. did. Actually. Art, there's a battle going on between the Jackson County Legislature and the Jackson County Executive, Frank White, that seems to be unending. Do you see any hope for that being resolved? Well, I think uh, wiser heads will eventually prevail. Uh, the, these seem to be small matters about whether you divide up procurement contracts into small amounts so you can buy a truck for the chief of staff. Those things, those kind, those kind of things. Well, there are real seem challenges kind of to White's leadership, are there not? There, there are telling but, him but, who he can hire and but, who he can't. There are there are really important issues like what are we going to do with about the Jackson County Jail, which, which is a, a a huge blot on Jackson County uh, that needs to to be addressed and and. I, I, sooner or later, uh, the legislators, uh, including Frank White, are going to have to face the voters. And I, I, I'm, I have some uh, confidence that the, the county legislators are going to 
find a way to work through this. By the way, the Jackson County Prosecutor Gene Peters Baker will be my guest at the beginning of the Ruckus program next week. Uh, we weren't expecting to talk about this, but it is a big story. Uh, Unified Government Mayor Mark Holland has called a special county commission meeting this Thursday evening. He says a year-end report shows widespread corruption within the fire department posing a risk to both firefighters and public safety. Uh, he says it costs the city about a million dollars more a year than it should. It's because of this shift trading that has gone on, I guess, in fire departments from time immemorial. Uh, what's interesting is Holland was just defeated in his run for mayor by uh, David Alvey, who ran with the strong support of the Firefighters Union. And uh, the incoming mayor, he takes office next Monday, has said he's fine with all that's going on. Uh, this is going to be a challenge, is it not, for the new mayor of Kansas City, Kansas, and Wyandotte County? Well, sure it is, but fire departments should be a challenge for every city government yeah. in the country. They're, they are structured in a fashion that was designed long, long ago when the firefighting world was a whole lot different than it is today. And they, the, the unions have become powerful enough that they're able to defend the way, the status quo, and it costs a lot more money. There's a lot heavier staffing than there ought to be, not just in KCK, right here in KCMO, let me tell you. And nobody generally, until he gets defeated for re-election, yeah, right. uh, finds the well, courage to and, say and anything the, much about the it. The fire unions wield a lot of political power, both in Kansas City, Kansas, yes. and certainly in Kansas City, Missouri. Before we wrap up this, yeah. this segment, Mary, uh, you're interested in Johnson County government. Why has Hannah Zacharias been terminated? Hannah Zacharias, the best answer? name in all of politics. Well, because uh, one of the members of the county commission has decided to throw his uh, political weight to the right. And I am extremely upset about the firing of Hannes Zacharias. You could not find a finer, more professional, smarter, more, more successful public manager than Mr. Zacharias. And I'll tell you what, uh, if, the, if this is about partisan politics, which I think it is, they pretty much said we want somebody more conservative. In 2000, the people of Johnson County said, we want a nonpartisan county government. And by God, it has been a great reform. Ron, is it a bad thing turn. for Johnson County to have a more conservative uh, slant to its government? I don't know it's a bad thing. I think it's in terms of a professional is doing his job. If you you make, take a risk when you change it. Because if it doesn't work out well, then you really stuck the people in the eye. And that's never a good thing. But we'll see how it works out there. you got to face the ballot. Well, the they have an interim city or county manager, and I guess they're having a nationwide yes, search a for a successor. Person, but, Do, uh, does Zacharias have any recourse? He's getting a nice salary while he's uh, unemployed. Of course. But, but the point is, Steve Clicker, who was on the commission, has a looking down the line at offices to run for, and he switched color, so to speak, from Mr. Eiler's camp to... Uh, <laughs> that must have been a fascinating experience. <laughs> I'm going to have to race uh, on here. We're yeah, short on time. <laughs> as soon as... Uh, don't even get excited, Ron. As <laughs> Soon as, Westport, right as soon as Westport merchants got City <laughs> Hall approval to privatize sidewalks, they got public outcries of opposition from the local NAACP. Privatizing sidewalks would make it possible for merchants to screen for weapons in the entertainment district that has been hard hit by gun violence. The civil rights group says the plan could increase civil rights violations and increase racial tensions. The Westport District plan includes hiring monitors to observe the process and presumably preclude any infringement on rights. So, Art, you're no stranger to civil rights cases and battles. Uh, can this be resolved in a way that both sides, the merchants and the NAACP, can be satisfied? I'm both a civil rights lawyer and a Westport business owner, so uh, I, I have, a, have a, a stake in this. What do you own in Westport? Well, my law practice is on Westport Road, so just a block from Broadway. Keeps you busy, doesn't so, it? I, it, it, does, <laughs> it does. Um, the, the city probably should have declared the sidewalks as a part of their ordinance when they privatized them as a public forum, which would have provided sort of a, 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 an, an equal access to them. It may not be... It may not be too late, but Westport has a bad history of, uh, of selectively enforcing um, uh, th their uh, 
um, their security measures against racial minorities and protesters. And it seems to me that the this needs to be watched very closely. The ordinance is done. It's not. My, I don't think the terms can be changed, but it needs to be monitored very, very closely. Ron, is, Ron, is it possible the NAACP's position might increase racial tension? Well, I, I think that's where you run into a challenge. Is you already put it out there. It's almost like preemptive, preemptive victimization. Before it ever happens, where it's going to be bad for blacks. Well, maybe it's not going to. Maybe it's going to save some black lives, which would be a good thing. I would, I would see as positive. But looking at this, what are you going to do? Just let it continue and escalate? You can't. Yeah, the options, I guess, aren't or limited. I mean, what else can you do? You're a Westport businessman. What other options are there to well, preclude is, gun? I know you yeah. say change state law, but that's not going to happen. At, at, Crime's a big issue, and, and th th this is just a little Band-Aid over a particular problem, and it's probably uh, uh, an experiment worth conducting, but it needs yeah. to be watched very closely to make yeah. sure it does not get out of hand. Or you're going to have everybody walk on the same sidewalks through the same metal detectors. Who's going to, if you don't set well, the alarm off, you're not going to stop. I think the yeah. greatest, one of the great things about politics is that it makes strange bedfellows. And it looks like we're about to have a really gender-confused relationship uh, of the NAACP and the National Rifle Association. Because <laughs> the NRA really doesn't like you know, the yeah. city being able to privatize right. the sidewalks and effectively ban handguns in part of Kansas City, the state legislature. Right. Uh, if the NRA goes down to the state legislature, you're liable to see a bill to prohibit cities from doing this anymore. So uh, if the NAACP is upset, they can call the NRA and they'll oh, have an well. ally in yeah. Jefferson City. This is, this is an outrageous example of how crazy what, a What is off. an outrageous example? The, this, the, the sidewalk privatization <coughs> issue and, and all the very legitimate questions you raise. Because if we had sane and common and commonly accepted gun laws, uh, then mayors like Sly James, who really understand this crime issue like he does, would able to would be able to have citywide sensible gun ordinances around. And we go down this line of okay, oh gosh, let's 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 ban guns in Westport alone. You know, but, <laughs> it doesn't make well, any sense. But, 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 but you're raising a situation that doesn't exist. The, the gun laws are not changing, not going to change immediately. The mayor has no they authority. Could we, change, they Mike. could change, but but all sorts of things could change. We have That's to deal true. with it's reality. Not, not changing immediately. And, and the option <laughs> is: Do you let the violence continue unabated in right. Westport, or do you make an effort to stop it? And uh, you, tell me, if if people walk through a, a detector one at a time, and there are people monitoring it. Why is there the risk of uh, racial tension right. and racial profiling? Right. Uh, that's the question. I, if I were the city and I want to do something about gun violence, the one thing you might get done, go to Jefferson City and support a bill to lengthen the sentence for felons in possession of firearms. It has been done before in cities, and it has worked to lower the gun violence rate. That will be and called I, racist, Rudy, I guarantee you. Well, I, I, I'm, I think you should do it. And they did it in Richmond, Virginia, when Clinton was president and, and really had a good effect on the murder rate. All right, we're going to move on. The Republican Party ended 2017 with a tax cut to cheer about and midterm elections to worry about. With tax reductions for both corporations and individuals, the party upheld a major tenant of the Trump campaign and Republican orthodoxy. Party leaders hope the cuts will increase prosperity and enhance GOP chances to retain control of both houses of Congress in the midterm elections. Do they have reason, Woody, to be optimistic on both of those counts? Uh, not, I don't think on both. I think in the midterm elections, it, it really is shaping up to be a big Democratic year. Uh, the reason when, uh, for example, when Obama was elected, when Clinton was elected two years later, wave years for the Republicans, uh, our government is so big and so intrusive in, in everybody's lives that everyone's afraid of it when it's in the hands of the other party. So you and then you elect a guy like Trump, who is, shall we say, outspoken, and and you really set off the fire on the other side. So there, in the low turnout, off year elections, the passionate party uh, generally can generate a wave, and it sure looks like the Democrats are going to do it this year. Woody, what about the tax cuts? Will they enhance the economy, make things better? I, I think they will. The economy, first of all, is already getting better. Yeah. And it looks like we're going to break, we may break 3% growth. All those people who gave up looking for jobs are starting to look for jobs. And I think the Republicans' only hope is to nationalize the election on that issue and say, right. you know, under the last Republican president, under the Democratic yep. president, 
we were growing at 1%. Yeah, up to now 3 we're growing at 3%. If you want to keep your job, you better not change horses. Art, That's not, their only Not any Democrat campaign. in the U.S. House or in the U.S. Senate voted for the tax cut legislation. Why are Democrats so adamantly opposed, do you think, to tax cuts? Well, it, uh, not, not to tax cuts in general, but to this tax cut in particular, because it was because it helped a, corporations. It, it was a scam. I mean, 81% uh, of it went to the top 1% of the benefits measured over over the 10 years of it. The people who pay more taxes. A and the people and the middle class and the upper middle class, especially, uh, uh, are at o over the course of the 10 years are going to end up paying higher taxes. And if I were a upper middle class resident of Johnson County, Kansas, I'd be really worried because there's a state income tax and there are high property taxes in Johnson County and no longer will those state and local taxes be deductible uh, above $10,000. Mary, you're a high income earner in Johnson <laughs> County. Are you worried? <laughs> No, I'm not, of course. But it, but are here, you opposed to tax cuts, generally speaking? Heavens no. No, the Democratic Party has cut taxes before, but, but what we not one here's voted the for this tax that cut. We, of course not, because he's right. Arthur Benson is right. This is a scam. And you know what? How could a Democrat be asked to vote for a bill that's going to put 13 million Americans out, take them off of their? Uh, deny them the right to have health care. That little piece of this bill was under discussed. Well, 13 million Americans isn't many, but it is. Well, it, it's not stopping people from buying insurance. It's, it, it's stopping the penalty well, on those people they, who they don't buy insurance. They won't be able to afford once the insurance no. companies well. aren't going to offer insurance. Those 13 million people count. Plus the targeting in the bill of people like grad students why in heaven's name would you try to pay for a tax cut by targeting grad students and really raising their taxes? Ninety-one percent, according <laughs> wow. to one study, ninety-one percent of taxpayers get a reduction under this plan. How is that evil and bad? Well, it depends on what you call a reduction, some little, you know, little deduction here and there because you well, have a little one more here child or whatever. Help some but it, it goes away. The child gets more. It goes away. It goes away if the Congress Mike, doesn't the renew it. richest people in this country did very well on a president Obama. And they're the Obama. ones who pay the most tax. And, well, so they deserve well, to pay fewer Mike, taxes. What, what percentage <laughs> of grad students do you suppose come from poor homes? Uh, not very many, I would uh, say. More should come from You know, the most regressive tax in America is a tax on some somebody over here on the east side to subsidize my child's education at the University of Missouri. Right. It doesn't get more aggressive than that. Her kid's never going to college, and she's subsidizing my kid's education. I, okay, we're down regressive. to a minute. Uh, Ron, uh, many Republicans are saying, despite what they believed at the outset, that Trump has had a pretty good year. They cite the tax cuts, reductions in federal regulations, GDP growth, consumer right. confidence is up, stock market. Dow's gained 5,000 points since uh, sure. Trump was elected. H has this been a good year for Trump? Has it been a successful year? And are conservatives coming around to saying he's our kind of president? I, I think it's been a good year for America under Trump's leadership. And you look at the GDP, when you look at consumer uh, Consum uh, when consumers are consuming. You look at the uh, government spending is up. You look at uh, businesses are investing more. So we're having a good positive economic recovery. Uh, you see um, so, uh, your unemployment rate is down 17-year 17, 17 low. Yeah. And that's, I mean, those are things, why wouldn't we be happy? It's like... This is a this trend that's been going on for eight years. It started in 2009. No, 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 there's no and recovery the here, Ron. Yeah, all right. It is an right. economic recovery. We, we have got, one, uh, we got to... We so, got wow, to... We got to... <laughs> unemployment, 17 year low, remember and that. And now... <laughs> we're in the court. And now, yes, thank you. Now we head to the soapbox for Roast and Toast, where the Ruckheads have 30 seconds each to glorify or vilify people and events in the news, and we start with Mr. Freeman. Well, I, Mike, I tell you what, I'm gonna, I'm gonna roast the media. And I know some people here love those guys, and we're part of it. But when you look at the situation where our country is doing better economically, we have a presence in the world, and, and everybody talks about with North Korea, finally we have a president standing up to this guy and saying, hey, not, excuse me, it's not gonna work. There should be every positive thing in America to say, we've got a country going forward, let's live and enjoy it, instead of saying, well, this guy's bad, and you know what, the bottom line is, our nation is moving in the right direction, we should be a happy country. All right, Woody. Uh, my roast is about as broad as you can get. Uh, it's approximately two-thirds of the American people, you and me. Uh, One-third of the American people over where I live on the right 
uh, look over at the third on the left and think they're just a bunch of revolutionaries who want to destroy the entire American way of life. Those people on the left look over here and say, oh, well, you guys are just a bunch of racists who would restore Jim Crow laws tomorrow if you could get away with it. And then we wonder why we have elections and nothing seems to get resolved. And we blame it on the politicians, and they certainly deserve it. But first of all, the problem rests with you and me. If we look on so many of our, if two thirds of us look on our fellow Americans as enemies, you're not going to get a resolution to your problems. Art? I have a toast. Uh, I'd like to toast Black Pack. Black Pack was instrumental in uh, increasing turnout in the recent elections in Virginia and Alabama. And I think, uh, I have no reason to believe this, just a guess, but I believe they will find fertile grounds in the congressional third um, district uh, in the 2018. In Kansas? In Kansas. I think Black Pack may very well be active uh, in our metropolitan area. And I hope they are. Let's hope so. Well, I, want to, I, I would rather start with toast, but a roast to the United States senators from Kansas and Missouri, in particular Pat Roberts and Jerry Moran and Kevin Yoder in the House. Mike, when are we going to hear an elected representative from our part of the country take this president on and stand up to him? He has become a divisive force, not it is already, has always been, in our country, but a divisive force in the world at large, standing up. We don't need any president to stand up to North Korea. The North Korean government should understand that our nuclear policy is defensive in nature. And only. you should understand I got to sign off. That's there Ruckus we for this week. The Ruckettes return next Thursday at 7. Now for the Ruckettes and crew, Mike Shannon saying thanks for watching and good night.